going on, everybody? And welcome back to another episode of the Get Over Yourself podcast, where today I'm joined by Jerry Scarletto. And Jerry, he's going to be sharing his interesting story coming from an amazing family and an amazing upbringing. I told Jerry just before we started recording this podcast today, you don't hear that story very often anymore where somebody's willingly able to admit that they came from an amazing background, yet life still has a way of tearing people down at different moments. So for all those listeners out there who don't always often resonate with the people who are coming from absolute horrible situations, granted, there's a lot we can learn from everybody's situations and we can learn a lot from those hardships. But at the same time, Jerry's story is going to resonate with a lot of you. So with that being said, Jerry, welcome to the show today, man. Hey, brother. Appreciate you having me. Looking forward to this conversation, man. Yeah, of course. And guys, Jerry, he's going to be sharing a lot of his insight about his early upbringing as well as his failures in business, but what he learned from it and his relationships. Jerry, I'm going to let you speak a little bit more into that so I don't speak out of place here. But guys, with that all being said, let's jump into today's episode. So Jerry, let's start off, like I said in the intro there, you grew up in kind of the ideal American dream, the ideal situation, or I guess the picturesque version at least, right? Where your family, they're doing pretty good. You don't have to worry about food on the table. You can play in your sporting events and whatnot, but it's obvious that you guys weren't like uber wealthy or anything. Um, what was life growing up like for you? Uh, you know, you hit it spot on. Life was good. We, we grew up in, I grew up in Baton Rouge. And then I moved to a place called Fort Thomas, Kentucky. It's right on the border of Cincinnati when I was 13 years old. Fort Thomas, Kentucky is a upper middle class-ish kind of town and a very football-like town. So everybody's into sports. Everybody's into football. If you've ever seen the movie Friday Night Lights or uh, Varsity Blues, it, it's that kind of town. So everyone's into it. Um, all white. The town was all white. So that was actually shocking to me because in Baton Rouge, I was a minority at the school I went to, which, which actually helped me in a lot of ways. Speaking of growing up in a upper middle class upbringing, that was my upbringing as far as my family goes. But I also got to be, um, got to be a part of this school where a lot of the kids that I was surrounded with were, were poor. You know, A lot of them lived on welfare and things like that. So from that aspect, I actually learned a lot. But from my own personal development, once I got into high school and college and things like that, you know, I started to see a gap in my own development and mostly in my confidence, which, which we'll get on here in a little bit. But yeah, my, my family was good. My dad was an entrepreneur. Mom stayed at home. We, you know, we were kids. We got into trouble from time to time, but it was nothing crazy. Parents were there to support me. You know, it's, it's exactly what you said. You hear so many of these stories, which are all great stories, by the way, people overcoming addictions and overcoming going to jail and overcoming this, that, and the other thing. Those are all great stories, but I don't think that that's most people. And so when you hear that, you go, well, how am I unique? Like what, what makes me special, right? And I'm not saying that what I have gone through in the last just 12 months, I hope that somebody has to go through that. But like everyone does have their own story. Like if you actually look at who you are, you actually think about the life that you've lived, you definitely have your story that's there that makes you unique from others and, and pulls out that uh, imposter syndrome, which actually you recently talked about on your podcast. So that's kind of the back end of that. I started to notice the gap in my mid to late twenties. And that's, that's kind of where, um, I didn't do anything necessarily about it for a long time, but I started to notice that gap in my mid to late twenties, as far as like my own personal development and who I was, mm -hmm. but yeah, the up upbringing was good, man. Upbringing was good. So I, 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 it's funny. I hear stories and I'm about, you know, people coming from, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk, his parents came from wherever they came from. And he's like, yeah, I had to overcome. He was born in America, but he still had that immigrant mentality and people come overcoming addictions. And I'm like, Oh, it must've been nice to have to overcome something like that. Cause at least you have a struggle that you have to overcome, but it's not, again, it's not true. You just have to like dig into your own being to understand that you have more in there. So yeah, I got to jump in there real quick. I'm a avid, avid, avid supporter and listener of David Goggins. 
He's like the absolute brain master. If you can master your brain, you can master anything. And one thing that I love in his first book, he talks about this. It doesn't matter what situation you come from. In his first book, he dives into, he came from an abusive household where his family on the surface, it looked like they were making good money for an African-American family in Buffalo at the time. Um, but on the inside, he was living in hell. His dad was incredibly abusive to him and his brother and his mom, and they went through so much trauma. And then when they finally escape, his uh, mom almost marries this other guy, but then he gets murdered. He deals through all this racism when they move back to Indiana. And like, there's a million stories this guy goes through. And then he relates that to a lot of the people he knew growing up. And then a lot of the listeners who are reading that book or listening on Audible. And then he goes, but at the same time, people go through just as much pain and suffering not necessarily in the physical or the, hey, my family's in a very dire situation, but it's people in your case, Jerry, where they grew up with very little to worry about. And he goes, that can almost be just as deadly because then you get in the state of comfort and you feel like life is always cherries and roses. But then when something really comes in to knock you down, it knocks you down hard. And that's kind of what happened to you. So dive into that a little bit. True words, man. You know, I look at it and it's like, um, one of the things that I believe is that you have to you have to regularly push yourself outside of your quote unquote comfort zone, and you have to regularly struggle. Struggles can happen in big ways. Struggles can happen in small ways. Small mm -hmm. ways are just like going to work out, overcoming a temptation, not eating that cookie. Like those are small struggles to overcome, and then big ones are like building a business or going through issues in a relationship and working through relationship issues and overcoming obstacles in other, you know, other interpersonal relationships. Like those are bigger struggles. So when I think about like my life, my early life, especially a lot of it, I didn't have to struggle all that hard. I was physically gifted growing up. I'm still, I'm still physically active. So I still have some of the abilities I had when I was younger, but I was physically gifted, didn't have to work all that hard to be good at sports. And, you know, when I got into any kind of skirmish or trouble at school, like dad would step in and kind of do his thing and help out. And, you know, I kind of felt like he was going to be there to, to quote, protect me if I needed him mm -hmm. to be. And then, like I said, I didn't have to work all that hard, even in school. Not that I'm saying I'm the smartest guy. I actually failed English a couple of times. But even in most of the topics, like I didn't work, have to work that hard to get B's or C's. And that's what I did to get by. So because I didn't have a whole lot of both physical obstacles, internal obstacles, or family obstacles, or life obstacles to really overcome as I was growing up, I think that's that gap that you're talking about, that thing that people that you might miss whenever you're growing up in a middle class society, like you get so comfortable in a middle class life that you have no resistance to push back. So you don't get it, gain any of the abilities that are needed in order to overcome challenges when actually you get into real life. Like I owned a business for 10 years. I just closed it last year on top of getting divorced last year, which we'll get into both of those two, I'm sure. But when I first started the business, there were a lot of obstacles that I had to overcome in my own, that's where I really started to notice that gap in myself, the self-confidence gap. And because I would start to get into these obstacles and I'd go, well, crap, I don't know if I can do this. I don't, I wouldn't say that out loud, but like, I would feel that internal resistance, right? I would feel that internal pull and I'd have to overcome that. And then I'd overcome one thing and I'd go, oh, okay, I guess I can do this. And then I'd mm -hmm. come up to the next obstacle and I'd feel the pull back again, but then I could, then I'd talk to myself and I'd overcome it and so on. So yeah, I think there's a definitely a big advantage to finding ways to put yourself in a position that you have to struggle. And if you can do it purposely, even better, because that way you're not having to go to jail. Not that that's something that you should try to do by any stretch, but like people, the reason that people who go to jail have such a good story because like you go man they had to overcome a lot but yeah they learned a lot but they decided to learn from it they decided to do something with it and that's why then they exploded there's also a lot of people who went to jail that decided not to do anything with it and they're either still in jail or they're still you know living in whatever circumstances so overcoming those struggles you have to decide to do something with them yeah, when you do decide to overcome those struggles, 
It's a mentality shift. And there's the reason why we hear these amazing stories and we can resonate with them when somebody goes through something absolutely insane that a lot of times people like you, me, and and everyone else who's had a pretty relaxed lifestyle, so to say, there's a reason why we attach to them. We think, holy cow, how were they able to overcome that? And each their own. Everyone goes through their own hardships. One of the biggest messages I share on this show is that I will never understand your exact pains, your exact mindset, exactly what you went through, Jerry. You'll never understand that for me. I'll never understand that for anyone who's ever gone through anything. The only person who could ever do that is Jesus Christ. And so with that being said, oftentimes we look at these people who are still in that situation before they've come out of the trenches, before they've been able to learn from their mistakes, before they've been able to overcome whatever hardship, trial, difficulty they've been through. We look at them and we judge them and we think, how on earth did they ever get to that situation? How on earth are they still that way? They're addicted to drugs, they're addicted to pornography, they're addicted to alcohol, whatever it may be. And we look at them and we mock them, and we judge them. But what's so important to remember when we hear these kind of stories is to think just because they're taking maybe a little bit longer than somebody else did to get through that and to learn from those lessons and learn from their mistakes, that doesn't mean they won't be able to. In some cases, people never do. And they pass away in this life and, and that's a struggle they always dealt with. And I wholeheartedly believe that God is a loving God and he'll be able to help them fix that in the next life. But for the time being, what our best support can be to them is simply loving them and helping them where we can. So Jerry, what kind of support did you get when you went through kind of, obviously you had smaller trials inside of your life leading up until this, but to lose your business within a year and get divorced at the same time, that is kind of a one-two punch that not everyone can handle. Uh, it is. So that both, uh, both of those things happened in the, in the last 12 months. They actually happened in about a six month time frame from each other. I separated from my wife before I closed the business and then the divorce was actually finalized after I closed the business. So as you can imagine, during that time frame, there was a lot, a lot of mental anguish that was going on. Um, ironically, the studio, it was a, I owned a fitness studio. That's, that's what it was. And that was my main community for 10 years, essentially. And that was my support. So <laughs> this is a great question. So when I separated with my wife, she was actually involved with the business in and out throughout the, those 10 years. Not the whole time, but she was in and out. She'd come and do some challenges with us, and she did some marketing and pictures and things like that. So a lot of people knew her and were close to her. And when we separated, a handful, maybe five to ten people, left because we separated. And then the community started to get this weird feeling about what was going on in my personal life. So everyone was attached to what was happening to me, and it felt like a lot of them weren't willing to weren't ready and willing to listen to what I had to say about it. And so ironically, and this isn't me, I'm I'm also an internal person. So I don't speak much and I don't show external emotions. So people that scares people, first of all, not scares them in a, oh, you're scary kind of way. But when you're going through something like that, and you don't show external emotion, people don't really like that they expect you to be sad and they expect you to be they're looking at jerry the robot over there (laughs) exactly exactly so that's why they didn't want to accept or come to me and ask me questions so i felt like i was abandoned i guess by the community that was so close to me during that time and when i closed the gym i almost like secluded myself which is one of the worst things you can do by the way whenever you're going through something like that I almost secluded myself to the point that I drove myself crazy. Now, luckily, I had a couple of guys from the gym who reached out to me regularly. One of them made me go hiking with him a couple of days a week to make sure that I stayed on track. He actually is the one that probably got me through most of it. To not, And it's not like we just sat there and talked about what was going on the whole time. He just got me out to make sure I was getting outside and actually being active. So... That's the support that I kind of fell back on were a couple of close friends that knew what I was going through and they were willing to look past what was essential, what was the demeanor that I didn't care. And they were willing to know the person 
inside of me and ask, hey, how are you feeling? What's going on? Hey, do you want to come out and do something? Hey, let's go out and hike. They knew what I was into. They were into the same things. And so we would go out and do those things together. And that was super helpful. The worst thing you can do in that situation, whenever you're going through something, is lock yourself in your room. And I know that because I've done it multiple times. And this time, I, I, almost, I almost allowed myself to do it again. But luckily, I let them pull me out and I let them kind of guide me along through this. And that's, that's something that is so necessary. So if you could go back and tell your, tell your younger self, the guy who was living up his sports dreams, who could kind of skate by in school, who went home and your mom and dad prepared you a meal every night and you didn't really have to worry about much. If you could go back and give them a piece of advice and say, hey, this is how you can prepare for the hardships that are coming, that are going to come in the future, because let's be honest, they're always going to come. That's God's little trick of uh, helping us grow on this earth is they're always going to come. What piece of advice would you share? And then with the caveat of knowing that some of the listeners are a little bit younger, they may be in that exact same situation where their entire life, it's been kind of just an easy skate by, but they're going to get through some kind of challenge. What, what advice would you share? So one of the things that I would do to get in my own way back then was when I was confronted with somebody who had equal or more talent than I did, they were better than me, then I would find some excuse to mm. not have to go against them, if you will. I, was, I ran track, so track is very much a one-on-one -on -one kind of sport. So if I were put up against somebody who had equal or more talent than me, I would find some way to make an excuse that I didn't win or that I just didn't perform well. So I, I say that first because one of the things that we need to do is to find people who we want to be like. And when I say want to be like, I don't mean like in a conformist kind of way. You need to be who you are. But as we're growing up, we look at people and we go, I like this person's attributes. I like this person's character traits. I like where this person is in life. And I think I want to be able to become something like that. Find people like that who are just one or two notches, quote unquote, above you, not above mm -hmm. you as a person, that's important, but above you in those character skills, and then flock to them and in a way, compete with them, not compete in a, I want to beat you kind of way, but so that you improve your own skills. So it pushes you outside of that comfort zone because it's when you get into the zone in the comfort zone is such a weird phrase, but it's so true. It's when you get comfortable with what you have going on that when, some, when something comes at you, you have no clue how to deal with it and you don't have the confidence to deal with it. But whenever you push yourself, and the best way to do that is by having somebody or a group around you that's pulling you along with them sometimes, when you push yourself to do it, then it becomes easier when something else comes at you. But you have to actively make that happen. You have to proactively get yourself in, self in those situations and be comfortable losing sometimes. It's okay. It's okay to lose sometimes. But if you just find a group or a couple of people who have attributes or have some sort of thing that you think you want to move toward in your life, go find that group and then. Compete with them, grow with them, push with them, push them, let them push you. And like I said, be comfortable, lose, be comfortable, not losing, be, be comfortable just failing sometimes mm -hmm. and ask them how you can get better. Yeah. And I love the sports analogy there. That's one mm -hmm. a lot of people can relate to. And sports is just amazing because there's so many life lessons you learn inside of it. As you're talking about that, how you kind of wanted to go up and start learning from the people who are a little bit in front of you. I had one of those harsh realities back. I still remember this. I was a freshman in high school. I had just started playing water polo. I'm from Southern California, and that water polo is pretty dang big out there. And I remember our team was going, we were doing a scrimmage with one of our other high schools just before the season was starting. But for some reason, the other high school, they didn't have enough guys to be uh, playing that time. They need a couple subs from our team. And it was a scrimmage, so whatever. We sent over a couple of our guys. And here I am, a little freshman, just still trying to understand the sport. I get locked up against one of the seniors on my own team 
he was playing on the other team at the moment. His name was Austin. He's like one of the best defenders on our entire team. Great, great defense. And I remember here I am trying to move in and get the ball, go score, um, you know, play water polo. And this guy is locking me up and I can't get by him. He's I'm drowning, flailing in the water. And I'm sitting here thinking like, dude, what the heck? We're on the same team. Why, why are you playing this hard against me? And I was so angry. And I remember um, I had a ride from one of my friends. He's a little bit older. Um, his name was McKay. He's taking me back to my house. Still didn't have my driver's license or anything when I was a freshman. And so as we're going home, he was a junior at the time. I'm like, dude, what the heck? Why was Austin playing so crazy against me? And I was like kind of venting to him saying like, this yeah. is my situation. He, why is he going so hard against a little freshman who doesn't know anything? And McKay kind of laughed and he's like, dude, you're in the sport of water polo. If you can't man up, what are, what are you supposed to be doing here? <laughs> and like at first I was kind of mad at McKay too. I'm like, dude, I'm just trying to figure this out. Like, I don't know how to play very well. And here I am getting locked up by one of the best defenders on the team. But then after I kind of here, throw a catchphrase in for my podcast here, but when I got over myself and realized like, no, playing against that best defender as a young kid was probably going to be the best thing that could happen to me. So then what did I do every single practice after that? Oh, baby, I met up with Austin and he <laughs> would lock me down and it was very difficult, but that helped me grow a lot. And then later in the end of the season, I got uh, called up to varsity. I was the only freshman who made it on the team. And I share that, that experience because it took me time to recognize like, hey, if I go up against people that are stronger than me, that are better than me, that are faster than me, that are better shooters, that are better defenders, if I can go up against those people and learn from them and compete with them, for a while, I'm going to be absolutely horrible. I'm not going to be the best. And I wasn't trying to become the best at that time. I was trying to learn from them because they're better than me. And then obviously it worked out. So um, Jerry, looking back now, you're going through this divorce. You're closing out your business. What was going through your head at that time? What got you through it besides that kind of support group, those couple friends you mentioned? And then what's on the ups right now? What are you trying to do to get out of that space and start something new for yourself? There was a lot going through my head, but I can tell you there were a couple of key points that, that happened. One is that I recognized that I attached part of my identity and part of my value to being, uh, being important to a group, if you will. We all want to be accepted by people. It's, it's a natural human instinct. And yet when all of the group that I was a part of and was the leader of, now, when I say that, again, I put that in quotes, I started the business. So everyone kind of looked at me in that way. The coaches, they, a lot of them liked uh, the other coaches more than they liked me, uh, to be totally honest. But but nonetheless, like I was the one that was like guiding the ship. And so when that was gone, I recognized that I had attached my value, part of my value to that. So one of the things that I thought about a lot over the last six months is what are some other things that I'm attaching my value to? Meaning, what are other things in my life that if they were gone, I would feel less of a person? And I say that because the less that you have in your life that you do attach your value to, the more likely that you won't be thrown off course when that, mm -hmm. thing, when that thing gets wiped away. Sports is another perfect example. I played sports all the way through college. I played college football. And I also had a depressive state about, for about nine months after I got done with college football because a lot of my value was in being an athlete. A lot of my personal value was in being an athlete. So when that was gone, that was gone. I'm like, well, what am I now? I don't, I'm, where do I go? I who am I? What am I supposed to be? So again, the more that you can detach from the things that you technically don't have any control over, whether or not they're in your life, the better off you're going to be. It doesn't mean you don't appreciate them. It doesn't mean that you don't work your butt off to make sure that they're the best. If you're an athlete, make sure you're the best. If you own a business, make sure it's great. Make sure you put your, your heart and your life into it. And yet, eventually that thing will be gone. Eventually, it's, mm. those things are going to go away. So you have to be able to not attach your value to that too much. So that was one of the main, like one of the big things that I, that I thought about. The other thing that I thought about a lot, and I still think about a lot, is confidence. I've talked about it a couple of times in this because 
that was a big thing that held me back when I was younger. And I still feel a lot of that still today. It's still something that I work on every day. Sometimes in moment to moment interaction, sometimes jumping on a podcast, speaking of imposter syndrome, it's like, sometimes you're like, well, who in the world wants to listen to what I have to say, right? So you have to, again, self-confidence is one of the things that will dictate your outcomes in life. If you have low self-confidence, there's a high likelihood that you'll have low outcomes in life because you won't put anything into them because you don't believe that you can actually achieve them. So self-confidence is another thing that I've been thinking about a lot uh, as of late. I've written, I've actually read probably three or four books in the last two or three months on self-confidence alone. So those are two things that I think about a lot and two things I think that can have a huge impact on the people in this audience. Because self, the early you can start to see those, both of those things, both what you attach your value to as a human being, and building confidence, the sooner you can start to do that, the more ingrained those things become. That's perfect. That's perfect. And Jerry, as we kind of start closing out here on today's episode of Get Over Yourself podcast, uh, first, of all, first of all, where can people find you if they want to continue hearing more of your message? And secondly, if you could talk to the entire world right now, they can understand you and they could hear you in this moment, what one piece of advice would you give them and why would that be? Okay, the first part I can answer easily. The second one I'll have to think about for a second. So the first part, uh, I also have a podcast. The website for that is goodwolfproject.us. If you go there, you can actually get a little self-confidence cycle PDF that I put together. You can put your name and email. Um, it's four steps that you, can, that, that you can go through either in moment to moment or actually sit down and write through in order to figure out the gap in your self-confidence. Uh, the other place is Instagram. You can find me there at Jerry Scarlato. I'm happy to DM back and forth if you have any questions. Now to the question. One of the things, going back to self-confidence, one of the things that I believe about a lot of people, about so many people, is that they lack self-confidence and they lack self-worth. The sooner that you can start to create both of those things in yourself, the more likely you are to achieve the things you want to achieve. Because one of the things that I believe is that almost everybody wants to be better in some way, shape, or form. It doesn't mean you're a bad human being. Everyone is worthy as a human being. And yet I believe everyone wants to be better. Mm -hmm. But there's these things, these ingrained things that hold us back. And the sooner that you can start to build your confidence and your self-worth and believe in yourself, the more likely you will be to achieve. And it starts by just taking one step. It's not a big picture thing. Take one step, do one thing one day, and move forward to that better confidence and that better self-worth. That's awesome. Well, thank you, Jerry. Everyone, take heed to that advice. Make sure to go check out Jerry on all of his platforms. And also, they'll be in the link in the description below. But guys, thanks so much for listening. Go ahead and share this episode with somebody who you think would benefit from hearing today's conversation. And if you have not left us a five-star review over here on the Get Over Yourself podcast, please do so. That's how I continue to grow the show. With that all being said, Jerry, thank you. And guys, we'll see you next time.